the core button is now pressed. Um, I want to make a couple of announcements. Um, tomorrow is another part of the building conversation series. So this month has been all about embodied carbon. Uh, and Chris Ballard, the CEO of Passos Canada, will be talking to Chris Magwood. Uh, if you haven't, if you don't know who Magwood is, it's a good, great opportunity. He is um, probably one of the leading experts on embodied carbon, a lot of the research he's been doing. He's also a great speaker and really nice guy. Uh, so that's kind of, that's tomorrow, um, can be signed up. It's easiest to go through the uh, events page on passoscanada.com. Uh, next week, we're having a passive house technical group. Uh, these ones are aimed midday, so 3 to 5 p.m. It's Tuesday, June 23rd. Uh, this will be going through the UVic um, student housing building. Uh, so Perk Kaz from Perkins and Will, uh, Ruffy from Integral Group, and Marine from RDH. Um, there is, I know that a lot of us have seen that UVic student housing uh, presentation, but we're there's some pretty deep um, new content that, that they've all pulled out um, to go through in that project. And obviously a big part of it is the, uh, the ventilation of the, the, the large kitchen. That's kind of the, the crux of that particular project. Uh, I also, Vancouver Socials, uh, I am doing my best to get us a bike tour. Um, July 11th is the current date. I'll keep you updated on that uh it's been a it's been an ongoing thing there's a bit of legal to put a large group together for covid era um but we're we're trying to get through that and hoping that we can do a july 11th bike tour that'd be a saturday um and then august tuesday 18th i've got a i see i've doubled up on august on my slide deck uh, i've got uh 6 to 8 p.m will be the next social and i think at this point we are going to do a throwback we're going to look at past projects um, from previous tours uh, and try and do enough a m number of virtual tours in that way. Uh, Roberto mentioned it. Uh, I'm going to mention it as well. We um, Passive House has a new course. Uh, we're calling it 310. Uh, it's how to identify embodied carbon. Um, this is an introductory course on embodied carbon geared towards construction professional professionals and policymakers. The course provides a high level overview of the importance of embodied carbon, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with the built environment, as well as a summary of embodied carbon calculation tools available to construction professionals. Uh, so this is going July 30th, 2.30 to 4.30 Pacific Standard Time. Uh, and Philip St. Jean is the, uh, the instructor for that course. Um, it is available to be signed up upon um, at the Passos website as well under upcoming courses. I, I also got a plug, we've been pushing the pathways to certification quite a bit. Uh, we definitely have a lot in Vancouver, but uh, heading into the summer, now that we can't travel as much, uh, there's an opportunity here. Uh, so I just wanted to highlight the pathways is 20% off. Uh, it's a fairly good deal. It is now all virtual. Uh, the virtual classes may or may not last. I can tell you that. Um, so it's an opportunity to, to get a, some really, really high quality training in a virtual space. Uh, and those are the dates for 120 A, B, and C. Uh, so that's enough of announcements. Um, so today's presentation is uh, is a virtual tour. Uh, we've, we've taken a little bit of video footage and uh, we're gonna bounce around the lower mainland. Um, I'm gonna announce each speakers, then I'll give a quick intro. But uh, so we've got a project tour at Lilac House uh, from Lucho at DLP Architecture. Uh, we're going to go to Earline Windows with David Funk, who is, um, he's going to introduce himself, but earline has gone under a, a change of ownership, um, and, and he's the new president at Euroline. Uh, Roberto is going to go through the ZebEx program and the Near Zero program, which if there is any passive those projects, um, step code five or high efficiency, it's something you want to know about it. it, it it's how you can get a, a pretty decent chunk of change of money. Um, and then we have Andrea Wickham from the city of Vancouver that's gonna go through uh, the new FSR incentives and, and detail those out. So uh, that's kind of our program for today. Uh, so I'm gonna kick it off with, uh, Lucho's gonna, I'm gonna give him the controls. Stop my share. Um, in that time, I just feel like 
we all probably, most of us know Lucho at this point. Uh, he's been a prolific passive house, high performance architect and builder in Vancouver. Uh, he's definitely one of the top one or two builders that the number of houses that he's built in the, in the area. Um, he, uh, I've always enjoyed his presentation. And I feel lucky that we were able to have him here today. So without further ado, thank you, Lucho. I'll unmute you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks for that, Chris. And, uh, Thanks for putting this together. You're doing a great job. Um, yeah, so if you don't know me, um, we did the first uh, Passive House in Vancouver in 2015 and uh, really focused on transforming our office to focus as much as possible on uh, high performance, but specifically Passive House. And right now we're probably close to 90% of our projects are passive houses. The only ones that aren't really would be retrofits or uh, TI commercial projects, which we don't have a lot of, but um, they typically don't go in as passive house. So uh, it's been somewhat of a success uh, since 2015, 2016. And um, really, really credit goes out to this, the first small community that formed here in Vancouver. And a lot of us are here online right now. And uh, it's, it's kind of amazing how uh, very few people have been able to influence and, um, and change what's going on in, in, you know, one of the most important cities in North America. And now, uh, you know, we see, we get accolades even from Europe. I hear of uh, presentations in Germany where people bring up Vancouver and they specifically cite projects and our uh, climate and all the work that the city is doing with transforming the zoning and regulations. So uh, it's, you know, it's really encouraging and, and, uh, and I hope it keeps going. So anyway, that's kind of an aside and uh, I'll introduce the, the project that we'll be showing. Um, ironically, this was supposed to have been our first certified passive house. It started in 2013 and uh, we're still not built <laughs> seven years later. And, and since then we have certified five more and we have three more that are within three, three or four months of certification this year. So we're hoping this one gets certified and it's on the path, uh, but it's just, it's going slowly. And in many ways, um, it, is, it is the most complex. It embodies all the problems that you may encounter with the passive house building, except for something like a commercial kitchen, which is happening in the Victoria project. Hey, Lucho. Yeah. Uh, angle your camera a bit higher so we see the rest of your head. Okay, because I can't see myself right now. How's that? Perfect. Perfect. Good? Okay. Good. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, this, this project is, is complex in ways that aren't necessarily passive house, but make it that much more difficult. Um, a few of those issues are underground parking, a uh, very small site for a multifamily. It's a 50 by 125 lot that's sandwiched between two large lots. So it never would have never would be consolidated with another property. Uh, and therefore, because of the RM3 zoning, which it sits on, which is not, which was never intended for single small sites, a whole bunch of relaxations uh, had to be sought, uh, not only with planning, but with also the board of variance. So I can go through those uh, after the video. And um, yeah, so wood frame, four stories, uh, underground parking, which would then require the use of an elevator for the tenants, which also presented another pro uh, pro problem. And those things really dr have driven the cost up, underground parking in the elevator. But if you take that away, it's actually very similar to a large house, both in the, um, in the approach to construction and the cost is coming in for the wood frame portion, the same as, uh, more or less the same as all of our other projects. So I will start the share screen right now and then uh, get the video going.
Uh, it's on the cloud, so it's going to take a bit to come down. Is it coming? Yeah, I can see. I might have it on my computer. Just sec. Are you? Yeah, because I, uh, I don't know why it's taking so long to, to download here. Because it's day of presentation. We practice this five times and it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Did you happen to find it, Chris? Yeah, I just need to find that link quickly. Uh, the link will come from the same uh, folder that I'm on, so. Uh, I'm good to go. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Ooh. I know what I'm going to do though. Sorry. Audio. Yeah. You guys hearing computer audio? Sorry. There, Lucio, are you anybody hearing computer sound? Yeah, I don't see the video. Sorry about this. There we go. Welcome to 1753 West 11th, which is a four unit passive house, four story with one level of underground parking on a 50 foot wide site. This is a lot that is sandwiched between two larger multifamily projects. So in essence, largely undevelopable. It is fully accessible with a wheelchair ramp. At the front we have, this is the south facade, we have exterior roller shade, electric roller shades that uh, completely uh, black out the four, five large windows. Moving inside, this is the entry foyer with an elevator, two units on the ground floor. The front unit is the smaller at around 1,000 square feet. All the other units exceed 2,000 square feet and thus are family sized with four bedrooms. The main wall assembly is two by six. Uh, Douglas fir number one spaced 24 inches on center with f which will have four and a half inches of HFO sprayed closed cell foam 
which has 93% recycled content and uses the ultra low global warming potential blowing agent. Each unit is equipped with a mini split, which is uh, totally sufficient to provide all the heating and cooling if necessary. However, because of our code, we are required to put in additional backup heating in the form of electric baseboard. Moving upstairs to the largest unit, which is about 2,500 square feet <clears throat> and has a double height space with huge storefront style windows by Puro Passive out of Poland. Supplied to us by Alex Shalinsky of Veda Windows. All the other windows and doors are the Euroline 4700 series. <clears throat> Moving upstairs, this is the top floor, same unit. The bedroom level has four bedrooms and a large uh, 250, 300 square foot mezzanine level overlooking the living area. The roof is completely TGIs that are crazily spaced at eight inches in some locations, moving to 12 inches, 16, and yeah, no, no greater than 16. <clears throat> we have uh, four Comfo Air 200 HRVs, one in each unit, which has been quite tricky to maneuver in a building that is required to have <clears throat> fire separations. As you can see, quite large bedrooms. This is north facing and on a clear day has quite nice views of the North Shore Mountains. Let's see if we can get to the roof, which is a flat roof um, with full seven inches of polyiso board over top of the uh, roof sheathing. And the joy spaces below will be filled with mineral wool. So I have seven inches of ISO board and nine and a quarter inches of rock saw or rock wool below. Moving up to the stair, the roof access, we have a <clears throat> access hatch that was supplied by 475 can't get up there but the city of Vancouver did reject a proposal to both install a partial rooftop deck and full solar panels on the roof this district has guidelines that prevent the use of roofs for any kind of gathering space or use by residents, unfortunately. And they would not relax that, even though there is no privacy issue in this neighborhood or adjacent. 
moving to the rear, you can see we have the external rock sole over top of Delta Vent SA. Wood strapping and horizontal white metal. And that's the guy who did it. <clears throat> Moving to the rear of the site, we have four, three or four surface parking stalls and the ramp to enter the parkade. This is the lane. A large rental building next door and a large-ish or medium-sized strata building to the west. This is the building from the rear which has a fully external and thermally broken fire exit stair of galvanized steel which will be elegantly wrapped in glass and custom perforated metal sheets which I can't wait to see go up. Everybody wake up. <laughs> Lucho, thanks for being my first guinea pig on that one. That was awesome. I appreciate that. That's a good video. Oh, thanks. No problem. GoPro 7. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing how you got those studs to bend like that. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Uh, do you want to take some questions now or do you, want to, do you have a couple of slides that you wanted to go through? What would, what would work better? Yeah. Um, maybe I'll make a few more comments and then I'll uh, put up the PowerPoint slides and then people can ask questions. The slides are just informative. I'm not going to present them or comment on them. They're just pictures and, and a short form spec. Perfect. And the, uh, the uh, uh, input from the PHPP, so the, ver the main verification uh, input. Um, just a couple notes that will help people understand this project. Um, because it's in the RM3 zone, uh, you're limited to 35 feet um, or a site if you're doing a single building. And so once you uh, exceed 35 feet by even one millimeter, you're required to step the fourth level back uh, based on um, certain angles. And ba so this uh, zoning district is, was really developed for podium and tower um, types, building types. And you will see a couple of those in the neighborhood, but back in the seventies and eighties when property was cheap, as you saw from our neighbors, people were consolidating and instead of doing towers, it was actually feasible, profitable to do just three or four story rental and apartment buildings. So that's why it's been, it was so difficult for us to, um, to, well, the reason why we have eight inch spacing on TGIs, which are nine and a half, nine and a quarter, is because we were really on the 35 foot, um, the brink of, of the 35 foot height limit. So we had to keep those floor and roof sandwiches to no more than nine and a quarter inches. And you know, it just required that kind of spacing. Um, the other, I think, important point about the project is if you take away the parkade, you take away the elevator, and you take away the interior finishes, the cost of producing a passive house of this level is the same for all of our projects, whether it be East Van or on the west side of Vancouver. So, and this is, you know, our marketing um, stick is, is just that. You, you, your budget will go into your finish and your, um, um, you know, your extra luxury or whatever else you want to add to the building. I can fix the cost of the passive envelope and be very accurate on that for any, any kind of uh, low rise or mid rise or wood frame building. After that, it's passive house anymore. So it's important for the public to understand how we can get to um, affordable 
passive house building. It doesn't have to be any different than market rate. It's what we include in that project. And there's no compromises. It's what we include in that project that makes it passive or standard. So I'll share the screen now and I'll put up my uh, PowerPoint if that's okay, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I haven't seen any questions yet, but obviously I, I can ask sure. some. Sure. Uh, the obvious, like, or I wanted to learn more about the ventilation strategy. So if you have four Comfo units, which I assume is one per unit. Yeah. Um, is this the fire separation issues were, are they, are they going through this suite to get to external ventilation areas then? No, the, the issue is um, it's on the second and third floors. So if you're using the roof, those or so if you're using the ceiling and those floors to distribute the air, then those three inch comfo tubes at some point will have to penetrate the drywall of the ceiling. Right. And technically you are required a damper at all those locations. But when you have a 2000 square foot unit on a single level, you're going to have up to like, you know, 20 or more comfo tubes. So it's, it's virtually impossible to, to run them through the joists and then have them enter the rooms at the ceiling drywall. So you have to make, you have to, you have to run a series of drops under the drywall, but then again, then you still have the problem of your, um, your distribution box for the HRV where that enters the drop that still must be, uh, dampered for, uh, for the fire rating. So it's unavoidable to, um, to include dampers in some part of the fire separation. Uh, so you just have to minimize them and you have to transition from metal to the comfo tube. In those places. Yeah. yeah, in those places. Yeah. So that's, that's the tricky part. And, um, you know, the inspectors are really, uh, even though there, there's an argument to be made that a three inch, um, pipe, it would be excluded from, um, a breach in that fire separation. They're not, they're not going to allow it so it they, they you must adhere to it. you must comply with the code it reminds me of the like boxing out the pot lights yeah that we're doing a lot of now it's and the same it's issue except in same issue. of having a a, 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 walk, a walk go through that you box, through. You have, you'll have a you know pipes three inch pipes yeah. So, yeah yeah uh i'll just let you ask that question i assume zebek is roberto uh it's a good one i like it Yes, uh, it is B. So yeah, Lucho, want, the rationale behind the city of Vancouver's requirement for baseboard heater, um, you know, are these cold heat pumps? Can they not heat sufficiently at low temperatures? Why, why did they insist on this? Well, the design, so there's, it, it, it's a bit of a technical issue and you know, I'm, not, I'm not the expert on it, but I'll, in our experience, um, basically you're assigned uh, design temperature in our zone and the heat pump will have a, a certain rating, uh, efficiency rating based on the coldest possible. And, and then it gets to that temperature and it shuts off. So it happens to be very close with the unit, uh, the design temperature and the shutoff. So if there is a shutoff on the mini split, you have to provide backup heat in case it does go up. Now, Mr. Slims are supposedly rated at minus 25, and they will say that in some of the literature, but that's not entirely accurate. It, it's, um, I don't think it will, and if anyone knows more about this than me, please um, interject, but I don't think they will um, operate at their, their optimal capacity at that uh, temperature. Um, so the, the distributors that we've got them from don't count on that. You can't use that number. Um, it's more like five, minus five or minus 10. So um, that's where we get into having to, you know, install the, um, the baseboard heaters. But, you know, it's a, a minor cost, really. And you, we can put in as few as we want. Um, you know, we're talking about $50 per unit and one in each room. So it's, it's not, a, not a huge penalty to pay. Just an unnecessary one. Uh, 
I guess uh, the other thing that was interesting to me is that wall assembly. So you've got the the low embodied carbon sp spray foam, the low, the HFO. Yeah. And then you're going. Was your air barrier on the? Is an external sheath between the like the delta board essentially out? Yes. And so this wall assembly really is a product of its era. 2013, there were uh, no um, official relaxations for Passive House. And because of the size of this, of this lot and the setbacks that are required in RM3, the only way to make it profitable, profitable is to absolutely max out the, uh, the square footage of the sellable area. So we had to come up with the thinnest possible wall and also uh, get a, a, a board of variance relaxation for projections into the side yard. So we are actually able to go a further three inches into the setbacks um, and gain all of that, the thin wall, thinner wall and the projections into the sidewall gained the owner 450 square feet, which ends up being really his whole profit on the project once it's uh, once it's said and done. So with that, he breaks even. With that that four four or five hundred square feet at at fifteen hundred dollars a square feet, that's basically his profit on a small complex project like this. Even though he's not selling it, um, the owner is actually him and his family are occupying all the all the suites. So, but it's still it's still an investment, and it's it's an important consideration for developers and and other people who um you know need to know that they're gonna it's gonna be a viable project if they move ahead with something as complex as a passive house. to put you on the spot 2020 yeah. now what would you what would that wall assembly look like um well frankly because of the rm3 zone i'm not sure it would be much different because they yeah. haven't tackled the rm3 but certainly if it was an RS or RT or C zone, yeah, we'd be much thicker and we'd be fully um, mineral. Yeah. Um, now, the, the comment about the wall assembly and the, the continuous air barriers, really we're comfortable putting it with, on the outside with only three or three and a half inches of insulation outboard of that because of our climate. I would, ne I would not recommend this anywhere other than um, the zone, uh, zone four or five, uh, def certainly not in any other zone, seven, six, seven. Uh, it, it, it's really one that we've designed and calculated only for this climate. For him, uh, for the, this, now the closed cell spray foam also mitigates the risk of condensation in that, yeah, it's not our primary air barrier or vapor barrier, but it does, it does create a, an airless monolithic um, assembly that would never have any condensation. Um, occur within it. Are you using vapor paint on the inside of that then? Or are you doing oh, it? Not with the closed cell. Closed cell after two inches qualifies um, for a vapor vapor bear. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Uh, Sal has got a question that we probably got to read out. Is it the Heatlock XT HFO by Daimliak? That's it? Yeah. No. Uh, so Demilek makes um and they are currently distributing their version of the hfo uh spray foam but it's not widely it's not widely used because the they're only distributing a um a test version to, to some select sprayers right now the only two that we know of that are in full production for any sprayer to use is the um isonine prolock 2100 and the, the um, insulfane something or other from um, uh, ProSeal, which are both, by the way, Canadian companies. And so is Demilek. So those three companies make the foam and are, uh, they're Canadian owned and they distribute it in Canada. A, lar lar a lot of the other ones are not, Isonine is not. Um, so, you know, there, there's another, if you have to use it, you know, try and use one of the local uh, manufacturers. On that note, unless there's any other questions, uh, we'll take it to another local manufacturer. Uh, so, so thanks a lot, Lucho. That was amazing. And yeah, no uh, appreciate your insight always. Um, next up, 
Um, I was introduced to David recently, uh, a, a couple of weeks ago on a couple of different calls and thought, um, your line's been a big supporter of Passos Canada for a long time. I'm sure most of us on this call uh, know about them, uh, know what's going on out there. Uh, it was a surprise to me, I must admit, that they've actually have changed ownership recently. Uh, and David's been brought in as their, their president. So they've had some changes and I thought it would be a good opportunity to bring in uh, David and um, uh, let him tell you a little bit about your line. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Chris, let me just get my screen up. Here we go. Yeah, Chris, thanks a lot for the intro and the invite. Uh, hi, everyone. I, I am new to the group. Uh, I'm sure I'll get a chance to meet many of you uh, in the coming months. Uh, I prepared just a few slides. Uh, I want to keep it pretty high level. There are a lot of changes going on over at your line, and I'll, I'll highlight a few of them. And then I'd be happy to take some questions and, and maybe this is uh, certainly an open invitation for anyone that would like to learn more about what we're up to or come out and see our new showroom, which I'm going to show you briefly. Um, so just a couple of things that are going on out here. The business itself did change ownership in late 2018. And so 25 uh, year old company, uh, initially founded on innovation, tilt and turn window, bringing it from Europe here to Vancouver, to Canada. Um, recent acquisition by a small company out of Toronto. And uh, they are in both the window business and the kitchen cabinetry business. And their expansion to windows out here in Vancouver, they have an eye on high performance uh, products and uh, you know, are excited to take the Euroline story forward. I joined the business in March of this year. Kind of an interesting time to join a business when you're just on the brink of going into a uh, global pandemic. Um, been interesting, uh, fast, you know, fast forwarding a few months, I think we've accomplished a fair amount under the cover of um, not as much business as we'd like, but we've got a plan to innovate and you know rejuvenate some of the things that are going on here at the company and it gives us you know time to kind of focus on our own knitting and I think that's what we've done my background I came from uh, California closets actually so I have a long cabinetry heritage and uh, recently I was selling commercial furniture ran a dealership in uh, California but I am Canadian I'm from the East Coast uh, try not to hold that against me I'm now firmly on the West Coast and I have no plans of going back I prefer to sort of drive to and from the snow rather than live in the snow. So it's been great getting used to rain though. A um, couple things that I'm going to talk to you guys about. Uh, we are expanding our product line and, and I'm very excited about our showroom. And I'd like to show you guys just a little bit on a, a virtual tour here at the, uh, at the end. High, high level. These are the things we think about when we're either trying to bring products to market uh, certainly performance, that's the heritage of the organization, uh, always has been, I think always will be. We're in the upper end of the marketplace. Um, certainly Passive House uh, is something that we think about. Uh, the tilt and turn window being, you know, one of the main products that Euroline cut its teeth on here. Uh, we also have a high performance casement and we're getting into high performance sliding doors, which I'll talk about. Aesthetic is critical and then innovation. Uh, probably something that as the company has gone through its 25 years has come and gone, but we're getting right back to that now. A um, couple things I think that differentiate what we do. Um, anything that we put into the window has a purpose and we're always trying to think about increasing the performance level, pushing the envelope and making sure that the product is going to perform not only now, but for years to come. And, and something as we were starting uh, the conversation just before many of you came on, the concept of the IGU or the high quality glazing that we use, uh, we're one of the um, only companies around that uses uh, not a standard stainless steel spacer bar, but a Quanex tri-seal. We purchase our IGUs from a company uh, out of Langley, PFG, and they brought this technology, uh, to my knowledge, first in North America many years ago, uh, probably eight years ago now. It allows us to um, insulate the glazing to the way uh, so that we can achieve both a 25 year warranty, but essentially um, get fantastic thermal rates and values 
hundred to you. So it, it's not something that you know, you'll typically find. We've had to talk to customers and explain it to them, but when they understand what it's for and why it's there, they'll see the uh, they'll see the value and the performance for years to come. Uh, another thing that we do, I would say, a little differently is we don't paint any of our uh, UPVC profiles. We foil them. And what that allows us to do is, number one, we can create textures beyond what paint can do in terms of visually, uh, but we also get um, a superb um, sort of performance, uh, especially, uh, especially when it comes to heat dissipation. And I'll get to that in a second, but what I thought, just in the keeping of, of trying to show you guys on the factory tour side, what I thought I might do is, and I'm gonna turn the sound on this off, so how does this machine work? Sorry, I actually don't know. I don't know if I can do that. Chris, can you help me with that? Or is that something that I... The button, I would imagine, but I said the comment at the very end. Okay, hang on one second here. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, right side on your video screen. Right side. There you go. Got it. So I'll just talk over it. So this is our foiling machine. It's being demonstrated by um, our product production manager, uh, Marizin. So ultimately, this is a pretty complicated machine. Every About 80% of the windows that we produce are foiled and are colored. Probably makes, uh, you know, everyone would understand color is the way to go. All of our profiles are white. So every single profile in a window, and there can be four, five, six different profiles that make up the construction of a window, have to be foiled individually. And all of these individual wheels have to be set. So as you can understand, it's a bit painstaking, but at the end of the day, our profiles are warranted for 25 years. Um, they last incredibly long, and the colors are infinite, including textures, wood grains, et cetera. So it's, you know, if you ever come to your line, we'd be happy to show you uh, the process, what it looks like. Uh, it's not your typical paint booth. And uh, it's a series of glue guns, jets, um, heaters, in order to pull this process off. Uh, we have a number of stock colors, but any custom color you can imagine, uh, we can certainly put on a window. And the other thing that makes it very interesting is Unlike paint, uh, something that you can achieve with foil is you can actually reflect heat. And so often when you get into making very large openings, we see this with um, sliding doors, for example, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. Uh, if someone wants a nine foot tall door, like it to be 17 or 18 feet wide, and they want it to be black, Depending on where you might be um, facing the sun or getting any uh, you know, heat during the different times of the day, that could be a problem because of expansion and contraction. If you use our cool foils, that's an issue that you're not going to face because almost 80% of the heat that is generated by the sun, the um, infrared rays, are reflected by these foils. So I think it presents um, an interesting opportunity because as we're seeing, people want color and they want dark color. So not only are 80% of our windows foiled, most of them are foiled in a very dark color, which look fantastic, but they present issues when you wanna have these huge openings. So it's sort of something that uh, Euroline has always done is the foiling process. And because foil has matured to the place where we are today, we're able to continue to offer what the market's looking for. And then the last thing I wanna talk about um, is our sliding door program. Uh, we are bringing a lift and slide door to the market. It's not something, it's something that companies do, but uh, we've not done it in the past. We've relied on a tilt and glide sliding door system, but it doesn't allow us to present the large openings that most, comp most consumers are looking for. So we've partnered with a company out of Germany, Aluplast, and we're bringing actually three products to market, a multi-slide door, a lift and slide door, which this group would probably be most interested in because you can get very close and achieve passive ratings with a lift and slide door. 
um, and then another door called a smart slide door. But the element of size is really what kind of takes over. And you know, also second stories, these are alupla shots, but as you can see, I mean, these are the types of buildings that we're being asked to put windows and doors into today. And you know, you need to keep up with, um, with the market and that's why we're bringing this product. It will be available in September and we're already starting to sell it now. Yeah. And then the last thing we uh, wanted to sort of talk about was our showroom. So we've been working on our showroom now for the last number of months. And I'm gonna actually switch over to my phone and just kind of show you what we're up to here in our showroom. So hang on one second, change this, turn this on, turn this on. I have to share. You're there as you may, if you change to speaker view and to make this work, I'm sort of making it confusing. You might have to yep. view on David's uh, thing. I can only make it public. It should work now. If you stop sharing, you'll you'll be fine. Oh. Okay. There we go. Okay. I recommend speaker view. Say that again. No, you're good. It's the bandwidth on the phone now with all these with everyone on there. Again, you test these things and they don't work when you want them to. Can you see now? Uh, I'm getting it frozen. Okay. Okay, so no. There you go. It's improving? Okay. So this is, um, I'll just very quickly, folks, uh, this is our showroom. Uh, it's about four or 5,000 square feet. What we tried to do in the showroom was present to a consumer um, an actual living environment. And so we're putting in kitchen cabinetry in pretty much every room. So this room that you're looking at right now will be a full kitchen that overlooks um, basically a, a patio area. It has a pass-through window that's a folding door system that's been shrunk down to become a folding window system. But with a large butt glaze window here in the front and a dining room table. So it's going to double as a place we can sit with a customer and review plans but we're showing them windows in a setting that might emulate what they're trying to do in their home. And each of these rooms is gonna have a purpose. So this room over here is really designed to show off multiple sliding door options. What you're looking at, tilt and turn door here, or sorry, tilt and glide door here, a smart slide door there, and then this is the lift and slide door that I was talking You're not about. seeing anything. You're not seeing anything. Oh, I'm sorry about that, guys. Yeah, it's gone. The bandwidth is low, is, is low, so that our live video idea didn't work. Okay. It came just for a second and gone. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Tried to tried to sort of present something, but I'll have to send some videos out. Um, When, uh, David, when is your, I think it's, I think it's the bandwidth on the phone. Is it so I'd probably had, yeah, there you go back to your desk. Uh, yeah. When, when is your showroom open? We're actually open. Yeah, we've opened the showroom now. We've been open for uh, a little while. 
uh, trying to follow uh, strict social distancing. But, you know, it's a bit of a construction zone. We would expect by the end of August, it will be 100% complete. Amazing. Um, any is the I was gonna add, like on that foiling, that's really an interesting process on Windows. Uh, one of the things as a builder, dark windows, they get to site, they get scratched. Um, so what's the what's your lens process with that? We have a protective tape that is on the foil to prevent that from occurring. Yeah. And if it does occur in a foil product, is it repairable? It's not easily repairable, to be honest. So it's something we try to be very cautious with. Uh, it's similar to paint, it will scratch. Mm -hmm. So we try to make sure that we're timing when the windows get brought to site. And we're involved in a lot of the installations ourselves. We have our own installation crews. Um, but I do think just conducting you know, um, a proper project plan so that we get them to you uh, at the time right, at the time that's right, yeah. Uh, where is that? I, uh, that's an easy question, so I'll ask it. Where uh, Where is that? Um, where is your showroom located? Sorry, Wait, we're located in Delta. Yeah, Delta. yeah. Uh, is there any other? Uh, I mean, I can I can say from a couple of our projects, we've definitely used and installed your line windows. Um, I see that. Uh, um, Lucho also just said that the the durability of the the foil is there. So uh, is there any other questions from the audience before, uh, before we hand it over? I think that is nope. Uh, appreciated your time, David. That's awesome. Uh, sorry that showroom didn't work better on the, the phone. I bet. Uh, we'll yep. find it next time. We, I no swear to everyone, we practiced this a couple of times and it worked fine. But uh, So on our schedule next, um, in the, in the light of, of, I mean, Lucho brought it up, and I think there's a big conversation these days. If you've heard me talk at BuildX or anywhere else, it's usually about the numbers and the costs. And uh, one of the programs that um, that I speak of a lot of is the Near Zero program. Um, it's administered by Roberto at uh, at Zebex, and um, I wanted to bring him along, bring him in to to tell everybody about it because it's really important. It's, it it dramatically can de decrease the cost to the consumer. Uh, of these projects and it's an important incentive put on by the city of Vancouver. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Roberto. Thank you, Chris. Uh, let me share my screen now without audio. <laughs> All right, so Chris, can you, uh, can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Great. So I'm gonna do a very lazy uh, presentation here. No PowerPoint slides or anything like that. I'm just gonna show you a website. So this, uh, so first of all, who are we? I'm the director of programs for the Zero Emissions Building Exchange uh, in Vancouver. We were set up back in 2018 as an arm's length uh, organization for the city of Vancouver. The city of Vancouver set us up with some seed funding. And now we've got uh, gone from a bit of a walking speed initially to a um, speed walking speed, I guess, now at this point. So we're picking up some speed. One of the, we offer a, we do a lot of, we're basically a capacity building organization. And one of the, so, and we offer, we, we administer and manage some programs. One of the programs that we administer is a part nine related program. And it's, it's called the, it's called the near zero emissions building program. So at the bottom of this uh, screen, you'll see what it's all about, basically who the products brought, uh, brought to you by. And obviously I've talked about Zebex. There's also the two sources of funding here are City of Vancouver and Clean BC. Uh, so the Clean BC is a provincial pot of money, and that is a rec uh, relatively recent addition to the program. The program came, the genesis of the program, uh, it was born back in 2018, more or less when Zebex uh, was formed. And it was strictly City of Vancouver project 
Vancouver um, funding. And the target was very specific. It was Passive House. So uh, full disclosure, the uh, Lilac House that was just presented by Lucho is part of this program. He was one of the uh, one of the first uh, applicants to this to this program, and I'm delighted to have him on board. There's a bunch of other applicants, obviously. I think there's uh, 22 applications came in before the program changed, and the program changed with the introduction of Clean BC. And Clean BC, when when the province came on board, the requirements changed. So it went from just being Passive House, City of Vancouver became step four, step five, so the introduction of the energy step code, and Passive House, and it expanded to include Metro Vancouver. So not just City of Vancouver, but you know, to the confines of, to, to the outer limits of uh, Metro Vancouver. As an applicant, um, you basically click on this one. And I'll just fast forward here. Uh, to the money, I guess. So this this is kind of well. Let's talk about the requirements first. So to, in order in order to be eligible for this program, it's got to be a Part Nine home, a Part Nine building. Lilac House is uh, considered Part Nine, and under four thousand three hundred square feet. If it's a multi-unit building, you know we've had, we've we've got some rather large buildings that are with firewalls. They they turn into Part Nine buildings. They are well over forty three hundred square feet, but the largest uh, uh, can't be uh, more than 4,300 4, square feet. So, and there's a couple of other constraints. The, when this program got transformed with the introduction of the province, in this, in, when the province got involved with this, the city of Vancouver also, uh, in, a, in um, collaboration, has changed the requirements a little bit. And it's not just performance targets. We're not just aiming for step four, step five, and passive house now, there's a requirement here that's uh, related to heat pumps. So we require to be eligible to enter into the program that the buildings be heated, uh, the heating come from heat pumps, not from uh, electric baseboard heaters and not from gas. Uh, so that's why there's a bolt there that says the design must include a heat pump to satisfy all the space heating. So there's a bunch of other requirements here. Those are the, the main ones. There's preferential, uh, treatment given to, and there's uh, some points listed as to what they might be. So that's important to keep in mind. What we ask, so these are the requirements. This is what you get. I'll skip forward by two tabs here, and this is more or less the formula that we use to figure out what we offer participants. So if, let's say, you've got a duplex, and each of them has um, a suite, uh, so like a basement suite kind of thing. And they're being built to say step five, as an example, the, you get 20,000 upfront, or the, the first, the, the base amount is 20,000. And because there's an, an adjacent duplex unit, that's 20, you add 5,000. And each one of those has a suite, so you add another 5,000 and 5,000 for the suites. So now you're up to, 35,000. And then if you're using, let's say one, let's say you're using two split heat pump systems, uh, like a sand and CO2 system, it's the only one of them at the moment, I think, uh, it would be two times 2,500. So now we're at 40,000. And then the city also wanted to encourage induction cooktop. So they, they provided an incentive for that. So this could really add up for single family homes. Say you're aiming for step four, uh, just a single unit and you're not, uh, let's, you know, let's say you're just heating your water with uh, uh, a gas fired water heater then, and you're not using induction cooktops, then it's, you're basically down to 15,000. But, you know, we consider these to be fairly generous incentives, especially if you're building, you know, multi-unit buildings to a higher standard of passive house or step five. The, uh, what we ask in return is this. So th this, this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a research slash incentive program. So what, what we try to do here is we try to uh, incentivize people to build to a higher standard, but we ask for things in return. You don't just get the money for free. So we ask for a lot of information, uh, as Lucia will attest to, 
in, in the first questionnaire. It's called the design questionnaire and it's all about design, obviously as the name implies. And it's about 95 questions that are typically answered by the designer or the architect uh, with input from maybe an energy uh, advisor or, you know, generally it's the energy advisor that adds to that. But it's fairly long. We ask for, we'll sometimes ask for, full, for a full drawing package to do takeoffs and things like that if we need to. Um, and this, and we, we analyze it. We also ask for a second set of information after construction is done. So when Lilac House will be done, we'll be asking Lucho, for example, for um, a bunch of information related to the construction of the building. That's a much shorter questionnaire, say 30 or 40 questions, I think. And then when the occupant or occupants have been in the building for one year and we have one year's worth of utility bills, we ask for, send them a survey monkey survey. And then we also ask for, um, the, the one year's worth of utility bills. So we're trying to kind of corroborate, we're trying to corroborate the, uh, the energy models that were done during the design. So it's a fair bit of information we asked for. Say we had, before we changed the criteria, we had 22, we're up to about 40 projects now or so. So we're collecting all this information and ultimately what we're, what we're trying to do is we're collecting this information for capacity purposes. We're trying to, um, learn, disseminate or consolidate the information and send it back into the world and say, look, this is what seems to be working and what isn't working. And these are the obstacles and hurdles that a lot of these pioneers uh, like Lucho have, have come up against. And we, we want to be part of the solution. So we not only try to build capacity within the building industry, but we also try to take down the barriers. And the barriers might be something as, you know, we, supply chains, it might be related to building codes, it might be related to, uh, you know, you know, conflicting, you know, mid blower door tests or whatever. We're, we're always there to try to figure out, we're all connected and we try to figure out ways to make uh, this decarbonization protocol or decarbonization uh, objective a reality sooner rather than later. So in a nutshell, that's the program. Uh, Chris, I'm not sure how much more time I've got here. But. Uh, we could, I mean, I have no problem cutting Zoom calls short because I kind of hate them. But yeah. uh, if you wanted to go through, I think the critical thing on that is to show, I mean, for everyone on this call is pretty familiar and, we'll, and generally in this community want to see more passive houses. This is kind of, this is really one of the quality carrots that are out there. Um, and I think, um, I think that the, the piece is, is to spread this is to let everybody know that near zero.ca is there. It's a program and the more involvement we can get into it, the better, uh, Roberto, how I got to get this question all the time. Like there's a few projects now that the lower mainland is open. Uh, if I built a passive house a year ago, would it qualify? Yeah. So there's, there's. That interestingly came up in a conversation with a number of uh, people that are have a lot to say about this program or define its future. So today, <laughs> today we added this. If the building is already under construction, that's okay. The construction must have begun though within one year of the application date. Okay. So we're trying to we what we've you don't done, want to go back three years. Well, that's just it, and we've had some people that have come to us for projects that were that were you know started more or less when when this program began in 2018 and so the the usefulness of the information that we're collecting becomes uh it sort of degrades a little bit as time as as it becomes more historical so we started if you know if you had to all these problems for 2016 trying to get your permit out of the uh vancouver then Many of those issues probably have been resolved by now. Maybe not all, but many. Uh, so we put this in in extremely recently today, actually, when we put it in. So, uh, and then, but having said that, though, for special projects, and I think it's at the bottom of the compensation page here. I think we write that projects that have already been completed, 
have not received funds through any other version of this program and meet the current program criteria may still be eligible to receive an amount up to $3,000. So what we're trying to say there, we maybe have to clean up the, if there's any conflicting uh, information here is that if your project's done and we were interested in a specific aspect of it, let's say you've got a combi heat pump that, you know, heats and cools the building and it also heats the hot water year round while this is happening. It was the first product ever introduced into the Metro Vancouver or North America or BC. Then we're going to give you some money to into that and ask you a bunch of questions, maybe feature it as a case study. So, and, and I think what's also important to note here is the case study thing. Uh, we, we are likely, well, we are looking at producing case studies out of the, out of the information that we collect here. So, you know, obviously we anonymize what we can here. We don't want to give away too much information, but part of dissemination of the knowledge and the capacity building is to come up with resources that people can click on and say, oh, how did they do it there in Vancouver or for this particular house? So that's what it'll look like. I, if, like, I think if there was questions or if people had projects that would potentially qualify best, obviously reach out, contact. Yeah, contact ZebEx. And when you when you click on near zero at zebex.org, that email goes to me. So that's how you get to me. That's how you get there. Um, I know that there is also a dialogue that Roberto and I are working on uh, just for this audience as well that will be coming up uh, most likely early summer. Uh, date hasn't exactly been finalized yet. I uh, would be with the city of Vancouver um, digging deeper into this context with some, some subject experts and people that have been successful um, in a big part of this, as everyone knows, and I face it on a daily, daily battle is, is convincing people of the value of, of high performance and city of Vancouver has been a leader in this space for a long time and, and applied these incentives. And it's, it, it, it's significant dollars. I mean, it, uh, there's a lot of mass and that, that kind of why I'm saying this is it does lead to, um, the next, in my opinion, I don't know if I'm allowed to call it an incentive, but um, the city of Vancouver, as I'm sure everyone knows, especially in this group, uh, has, has changed the rules on the FSR uh, and the FSR bonuses. So uh, we're very lucky to have Andrea join us. Um, she is, uh, she's here to tell us a little bit about that program and, and how, how it, it, it's going to operate. So um, without further ado, Andrea, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to stop my video and share my screen and talk to a couple slides first and then I'll come back if there's any questions. Well, I got a slight pause. Thank you, Roberto. I don't think I thanked you for that. I stole the thing. So uh, good work. I appreciate it. <laughs> hmm. Having issues. Hold on. What are you guys seeing? Zoom. Uh, yeah, just just all the speakers are when it is. Andrea, while you're doing that, maybe I'll just answer one of Melvin's question. You can you can just sure. I know you. Okay, sure. I'll just distract them away from you. How's that? Please do that. Please do that. <laughs> um, so Melvin, you were asking about whether it's going to be part. There's something in part three. So at the moment, there's no plan right now. Zebex also administers a. Uh, assists integral group in administering um there you go andrea it's working in administering the uh, near net zero energy ready uh challenge so a lot of money involved with that but that's that's the uh that's the part three project that competition's wrapped up but um in the future there may be something at the moment there's no works uh, nothing in the works I think I would add to that too is in the, like in the world of clean BC on the part, the, the part three stuff, there's, there isn't, there's smaller cash values, uh, but within BC hydro and, and I believe Fortis has one as well within clean BC is a good place as a resource to check in with. Um, right. You get like, if you take a part three house and put it to a heat pump, you're going to get five or $6,000. Please don't quote me on that. Um, but there is, there is a bunch of those incentives there through clean BC, um, in, in part three. And I mean, 
Part three is neighboring on code for Vancouver now. So it would be outside of there um, in that place. So the incentives where like I always talk of when you're changing a market uh, is you've got the carrots, which is the, like the leaders of the industry, which we've been talking about at Passive House for a long time. Uh, and so you've got, now you're getting incentives in those carrots and there's the stick falling behind, which at this point is, is the energy step code. And as we progress up that in time, um, that's kind of everybody's forced to come along, whether you like it or not. So, um, yeah, they, they clean BC has this commercial new construction program for part three buildings and, you know, some the capital incentives are up to 500 grand. Um, they're big. Uh, so yeah. There's other, if you check out the Clean BC website under Clean BC Commercial New Construction Program, that's where you're, you'll find, but that's new construction. All right, Andrea. Okay. You're still now. All right, so I just wanted to tell you guys just a little bit about these new incentives that we've got in Vancouver for Passive House. Um, we, always, we always do what we can for people that are doing Passive House and doing good work, but the hope here also is that we can actually draw in other people and draw in mainstream builders and, and start to change the market a little bit. Um, okay, a little bit about me. I'm a green buildings planner and I focus on zoning policy uh, related to zero emission buildings. And doing this work builds on what I've been doing for way too long at City of Vancouver since the beginning of time. Um, essentially trying to get zoning out of the way for what we used to call green buildings and now we're calling zero emission buildings. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of context in case any we, anyone's wondering why we focused on incentivizing single family homes and duplexes. The short answer is that we have done some work to incentivize higher density forms. We've got the zero emission catalyst tools program. And I think the bottom line is we want to help uh, because the, the, there definitely has been a bit of a sort of struggle in that I think some some people internally have said you're, you're incentivizing a the single family home. It's a um, like in a housing crisis. Why are we doing this? But at the bottom line is we want to help any zero emission building, whether it's single family home, whether it's a, a massive town downtown. And ultimately, as this image shows and as our stats tell us, we're still a city that's largely made up of single family homes. Um, so this form is getting built. Let's make it better. Let's see what we can do to help make it better. Um, another thing to note is that our building code updates will mandate increasingly more energy efficient buildings over time, but the incentives I'm going to tell you about hopefully provide motivation to build well now and focus on envelope based solutions like passive house. On to the incentives. So in March, uh, this council passed zoning changes that allow single family and duplex passive house and other equally rigorous zero emission standards like Interfit and ILFI Zero Energy to access the following suite of tools. First of all, the big one is a simple flat rate floor exclusion wrapped up in an easier process. So what's not to like about easier process in the city of Vancouver? Um, this is actually a big deal because it's the first time we've been able to do a modest incentive and not just return floor space that was eaten up by insulation. When I started doing this type of work, trying to get zoning out of the way, we couldn't say incentive. Like we, we had to use all, every, every report had spelled weird euphemisms for incentive or, you know, like removing barriers and, and we could not say the word incentive. So this is, this is coming so far forward for us. Um, and the idea is to recognize, like I said, and assist early adopters, but also hopefully get some regular builders to take a leap and try a zero emission building or try passive house. Um, I don't want to put a number on that extra floor space, but you can probably do the math on a typical Vancouver lot. And you know, if it's 150 square feet, you can do that math and given Vancouver real estate, that's fairly significant. Um, we've also allowed for a little bit of additional height and created some flexibility in the front yard, which again was like, we were able to always, very rear yard depth so that if you're getting this extra floor space like you've got to fit it on site within current zoning and the front yard was always untouchable and for whatever reason like if we just keep going at the people on the zoning file eventually now you know we were able to get a little bit of flexibility within reason in the front yard so, so it's just always making those slow incremental changes um Finally, I, I think, again, this is kind of an underrated piece, but we created some flexibility line regs and, and talked a bit 
personal stories and the way that um, height is counted. And, and just again, hearing what people are, people like Lucio and others in, in, in the industry are saying, we've tried to respond a little bit to all the micro irritants that they might deal with and as best we can. Um, and I just want to highlight that has this has been the case in recent years, but when you guys come in to apply for these uh, relaxations, one of the things that we have wired into it is you get a pre-app meeting with a senior person in the housing review branch, which is worth its weight in gold. Um, so in a process that has very little certainty, this gives you some certainty and it gives you some consistent advice up front with the same person and, and you can work out some of those issues. So uh, that's just like it's it's a, a, a small piece on paper, but I think has proven to be a big piece in real life. Um, that's it. I just wanted to cue you to, so I'm a policy planner and I write stuff like this. And so I'm happy to, to have anyone call me and I can probably direct you to the right person. If you have a project specific question about these new incentives or you, you want some interpretation or, or you know some more specific assistance, my colleague Shylan Black also works on zoning stuff and he's been, he was a development planner for many years and really understands the interpretation of the zoning bylaw. Also, uh, many of you probably know Chris Higgins, my colleague, and he does building code stuff. Um, so if it's a question related to building code, get in touch with me and I can, I can connect you with Chris. Uh, I, think, I think that's it. And happy to field any questions or happy to have anyone email me and get in touch. Uh, Sanjeev, do you wanna ask your question directly? So I just don't have to repeat it. It's a pretty easy one, but. You there? I can unmute you too. Can you hear me now? Yep, yep, sorry about that. Uh, if you're doing a uh, development permit in Vancouver, can you, these FSR applies on top of that? Mm. Not totally sure what you mean. Uh, on top of it's a regular permit for example it's maybe 60.6 fsr development permit can go to 0.7 fsr so these 20 percent fsr these 18 or 16 percent can go on top of that i'm going to direct you to i'm um, send me a quick email tomorrow and i'm going to point you to we have a, a guideline document that explains how to calculate it exactly um, did you catch my email? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Awesome. I think too is I can, um, I'll get, grab that guideline document and I think it'll be helpful and I can send it to everybody. That'd be on, great. On That'd call. be awesome. Especially when saw, you all do the questionnaire. <laughs> and Lucio, you asked what zones it's RS and all RS and RT zones. Okay. And it, can I ask a verbal question as well? Yes. Okay. And oh, I'm sorry, Chris, can you ask a verbal question? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you can. Um, uh, related to maybe expanding on Sanjeev's question, uh, I think we had this discussion um, just after the council meeting, mm -hmm. and I had the same question, which, if if I may ask in a different way, is for certain zones um, where there's a bonus to say retain the structure. Or, um, and, and so you, instead of demolishing a building, you'd have the 0.6, but if you retained a structure, you'd make it 0.7 or 0.75 in some points, in some zones it's 0.8. Would you be able to apply the scene in 18% again on top of that bonus FSR going? This, this is a perfect question for Shailen. It, it's an interpretation piece and I've never, I've never done any implementation so i write the policy he implements um so okay. do you know you know his email and uh, i'll just comment what i've found out from general staff at mm -hmm. Vancouver because we did have a project that did inquire specifically on this and there's been no answer from planning basically they don't know so hit hit us up tomorrow and we'll see what we can do like just in terms of connecting and yeah Thanks. we're always happy to to where we can to try and facilitate any i mean obviously 
you know, like, like we'll, we'll try and facilitate any kind of questions with the appropriate staff person or see what we can do if, you know, there's any linking, we can linking up with the right people we can do. Great. If I'm on like a quick math, if- Oh no math. I can do the math for you, I got, I'm the accountant. Um, but you're like an RS-133 by 120, which is kind of like always that famous standard lot in Vancouver at 0.6, you're at like, let's call it for easy math, around 2,500 square feet. Um, there is, there's ways to stretch that a bit, but essentially you're, if you're going a duplex on that place, you're getting 18% more. So at 20, you're like kind of that RS-1 standard house can now be like in a 28 to probably 3,000 square feet range is what this is kind of giving us in a place. Uh, quick math that did give me about 300 plus three to 400 square feet. So I think that like what I'm doing and making Andrew agree with my math is there's a 400 square feet or so in the city of Vancouver at like a retail price of 1200 bucks a square foot is, is a pretty big dollar value incentive. Um, Roberto showed us an example of, of pretty significant dollars that you're also available in incentive and now pushing this. It's, it's really trying to um, eliminate this idea that high performance has to be more expensive. I think with through these levels of incentive right now, if you can build it, um, you could probably build a case that you can actually, at the end of the day, push more money out the door in your pocket um, through, through high performance than not, especially in the season. Kind of with the point that I was gonna. You know, uh, I, I wanna add something here if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm gonna add something here because when you are using a, a passive house, uh, in order to encourage the clients to, uh, instead of using two by six walls and also two by twelve walls, so you're gonna lose floor area inside the uh, like usable space. So that's why the city is intensifying that to create uh, that encouragement that people think that they're not losing that space if they build passive house or uh, step code five. This goes a little bit beyond that though. We previously, that's what I was saying is previously we were able to give you back what you lost. And this is a few percentage point, like 3% more than to, to account for the extra costs of uh, uh, like an in industry up speed until the sort of supply chain happens and it's easier and cheaper for everybody. This is for early adopters to sort of help out. So it is, it is beyond just what, what you get back for insulation. Um, and I should just say, you were talking Chris about, about selling this to clients, this, this type of, so we require certified passive, like we require certification in order to be able to give any kind of relaxations like this. Um, so this works hand in hand with Roberto's near zero program um, and that funding. And then, um, Roberto and I are working together on putting together something talking about these two pieces for early July, like a webinar mid July. And and a good component of it is going to be uh, how to sell this, how to, how to get your clients to take the leap, how to use this to your advantage. And so more to come on that. I think one of the is someone that's been in this for a while and is, and I mean, I, I mean, we're not, no one on this call at this point is any different than this, but I think it's definitely a, um, the idea of health and comfort. So you're getting these thicker walls, you're losing, I mean, in, in theory, you're, you're now gaining more FSR, you're gaining more advantage on a real estate point on an ROI, but the health and comfort is so significant. So that's what the, um, the dialogue that ZebEx is putting together is, is, is definitely related to how do, how do we, how does this come to market? Because even still with this level of incentive, there still isn't, a, it's not like the passive houses are pouring in or coming through. Uh, there's still market leaders, but as an industry, how do we progress and how do we see this uh, become the norm uh, is what, what, uh, what everyone's working towards. And, and this group especially is how we ask, uh, is how do we progress that as, a, as, a, as the passive house community and as the leaders, um, how do we bring everybody else on board is kind of what that dialogue is all about. Yeah. Um, any other questions for, for Andrea at this time? Actually, I, I have something that relates to what Andrea said. That, that's, that's sort of half counts for question, Andrea, but it's, it's directed at, to Lucho. And it's, and, you know, 
Andrew was talking about, and, and Chris as well, they were both talking about, you know, getting the, getting the, uh, increasing the uptake of these passive house step five, or in this case, passive house homes. Um, what, in your view, Lucho, what, what, what's most, what works in, in, what do you think would work in actually increasing the uptake of, of passive house with, with these incentives in place? Is it just promoting the incentives or does it go beyond that? Um, I think it's it's mainly promoting the incentives, but at the end of the day, and I, I I say this regularly to anyone who wants to talk about it or listen about passive house, is there's really two types of people who will go for it. There's the ones that come to you because they're passionate about it, and there's the ones who don't care about it but will do it for the incentives. So, <clears throat> in our experience. Um, those have been that those two attitudes have prevailed and it's kind of tested recently on a larger project we have with a strata, which we didn't go passive, but we pushed a lot of high performance uh, components and issues. And it was virtually a deadlock 50 50 between the people who absolutely had to have them because of the comfort and efficiency topics and 50% who didn't care at all because um, of the numbers associated with it. And in that case, because it's not, it wouldn't, this project wouldn't be a part of any incentive program, then that 50% who didn't care voted against the components because they were simply more, a little bit more, a little bit more expensive. And were also not part of their, uh, let's say, the cultural lexicon and their experience uh, living in shitty buildings. <laughs> Basically, I've lived in a shitty building all my life and no one's gonna tell me that it can get any better or that I'm gonna die tomorrow if I don't. So that's kind of the problem. Um, so yeah, 50-50 and what would solve that? You know, moving forward obviously is the complete policy change, but in the, um, you know, before that, the will work and we do try as hard as we can to convince people to go uh, high performance and if you have the opportunity to get an architectural stamp you can insist on it and say you will not sign off on the schedules <laughs> so <laughs> or an architect <laughs> Actually, that, that, you've got either end of the spectrum when you describe the people that are passionate and people that don't care and I'm trying to figure out, like, there's another market, and they're willing to spend money on finishes, like you always say, Lucio. So how do we turn this, like, how do we do for, for Passive House, Tesla did for electric vehicles? Like, how do we make this cool? And a friend of mine is a real estate marketer. He said, you guys are, you're all, like, about talking about bureaucrats. You're so boring when you talk about this. You know, like, like call it a German fresh air machine and, and sell it like that. And, and so that's, like, there's a segment of the market that I think could be persuaded Somehow, I mean, it's God, it's not a bureaucrat that's going to do it, but that's what I'm hoping Roberto and Alcom is something great for the seminar. But, but there's got to be a market of people that, we, that can be convinced in the same way that Tesla's became cool, you know, and they're not just do gooders. In, uh, in a strange way, I think this isn't my opinion, but I think this little national pandemic and people spending a lot of time in their houses mm. and, and an awareness on health in the living environment. Uh, is going to go a long way for the, the, the high performance, which is also a terrible term in marketing term ways uh, to talk about, to talk about uh, where high performance homes are going to go with, with the net zero and passive house and all these things. So I mean, there's a, there is an opportunity that, that is a, is awake in a lot of people and it's, it's noticeable. We're seeing it. I can, now that I'm wearing my Paso's house Canada hat, uh, we're seeing a, a very different level of people are uh, reaching out um, across the country, uh, inquiring about Passos Canada. How can they get involved? How can how can we change? How, how can we change how we do this? So, uh, although the national no one wants a national pandemic, uh, it is cause for change, and I think there's an opportunity to to, to like all work together and make that change happen. Um, that's my soapbox for the for the Tuesday evening. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I agree with Mel. I'm just reading Melvin's comment. Another group of people who always built with Tyvek and Poly don't want to change the way they're building. Um, it's it's true. Uh, you once you dig into um, the air bearer policies and like even just with city of vancouver going to 3.5 air changes and the people that are constantly not meeting that air change level and are building with that that old school technologies uh it's this it's the same repeat offenders but i mean they're going to get hit by code I mean, even having the 3.5 exactly. uh it's changing and and they're they're scared and they're, and there's people evolving and changing quickly um i think the other like the real other reality is we're we're built, I'm a custom home builder, but the city of Vancouver is built on speculation builds. I mean, fundamentally the volume, there's a large volume of spec build houses and they're, they're fighting that they're, it's a, it's a dollar game. Um, hopefully these incentives start to, to wake them up. I mean, the ability to go duplex multiple units and those sort of things in the city of Vancouver, and you combine these incentives, uh, the math is starting to add up that it makes sense. It, like you can, you can go high performance if you figure out how to do it on well, and that's going to really start to change a market. If guys can start to make money consistently in this place with this incentive load, um, that's when you'll start to see some really big change and then it'll force, it'll force it through. So any like, I mean, Lucho and both Andrew have a lot more experience in that world too. If you want to add it to that, you're more than welcome to. I generally agree. Yeah. There you go. Um, I am happy to cut this short. We don't have education credits. If anybody wants to stay on, they can, but uh, I don't know about you guys. I have lots of Zoom meetings these days. So um, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Lucho, David, uh, Roberto, and Andrea. I uh, appreciate you, um, you testing this out and going through that. Um, and everybody else, thank you for showing up. I will, there will be a follow-up email with a questionnaire. And I will, uh, I'll provide uh, any pertinent links uh, that we're talking about and documents. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank we'll you. Bye-bye.